folks, and welcome once again to the Hour of the Time. I'm your host, William Cooper. We continue where we left off last Friday night, February the 12th. And I want to quickly reiterate that what you're going to hear does not necessarily reflect my beliefs or my religion or the beliefs of the staff or management of WWCR Worldwide Christian Radio. What you are hearing, folks, is for the first time in history the public revelation of the origin, the history, the dogma, and the identity of those who operate in secret to bring about a worldwide totalitarian socialist government. They are known to Christians as Mystery Babylon. It is an ancient religion. Now get a pencil and paper ready, because if you did not tape last Friday night's broadcast, or if you did not hear it, you must order it. You must order it. You have to have this information. And if you have any possible way to tape tonight's broadcast, either tape it or order this tape. You can order studio quality tapes from us, and I will give you that information later in this broadcast. Make sure, as always, that you have pencil and paper or pen and paper by your side at all times. You will want to write down important portions of this broadcast, and you certainly will want to get our address and phone number and the price of the tapes. Those of you who are smart enough to know what is transpiring here know that these are historic broadcasts, and by making these broadcasts, I have sealed my fate. The sun enters each heavenly sign or house of the zodiac in what is called the 30th degree and leaves at the 33rd degree. Thus God's son is said by the ancients to begin his ministry at 30 and dies at 33. A Freemason is not told the truth of the object of his worship until he attains the 30th degree. And this is why the highest degree in Freemasonry is the 33rd degree, for no one can rise higher than the sun. When viewing the shimmering rays of sunlight on a body of water at dawn or sunset, one can still see today how God's sun walks on water. It was well understood by ancient man that our weather was caused and controlled by the sun, it was a simple fact that God's Son had the power to control storms at will. The ancient Egyptians taught that he did this as he rested in his heavenly boat while crossing the sky. Thus we read that God's Son quieted the tempest, our great storm on the sea, while in his boat. Which boat? The boat of Isis. Ra, the sun god, also known as Osiris, in the bark of millions of years in which he traversed the heavens, he wears on his head and accompanies a vast sun disk symbolizing his powers as lord of the heavens. The boat formed of a serpent bears his eye, and the god is seated on a pedestal representing Mayat, the divine order. 
folks, when we stop to realize that every single king, prince, lord, governor, dictator, despotic ruler, civil and social institution, national flag, coat of arms, educational institution, military medal, award, organizational insignia, medallion, badge, emblem, citation, trophy, banner, pendant, political standard, our ensign, agency of government, our religion, uses the sun as a primary symbol, then it can truly be said in the mystery school that God's Son is, quote, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, unquote. Here we note another cleverly disguised part of the whole, according to the mystery school, misunderstood and plagiarized story, for they believe that Christianity is a perversion of the mysteries, and that's why they hate Christians. In the ancient world, months were counted according to the phases of the moon. They were called the lunar months on the lunar calendar. Now, since Scorpio, the scorpion, is the astrological sign starting in late October, the first month of autumn, it follows that October, the scorpion, with his deadly backbiting tail, betrays the sun in autumn, leading directly to his death in winter, and is known as Judas. And that's where the October surprise comes from, and I'm telling you right now that Barbara Honegger was a plant. And the 30 pieces of silver were, as the North American Indians would say, 30 moons of silver needed for the month to betray the sun and cause his unhappy death. In relation to this, another interesting point, factually speaking, when a person is bitten by a deadly scorpion, the wound appears to be, or looks like, two human lips. The ancients called this the kiss of death. This is why we read that Judas, our October, gives God's son the kiss leading to his death in winter. And that is the original October surprise. There was an October surprise in France on Friday, October the 13th in the year 1307. Look it up, but in case you don't, I will cover it extensively later. The next point to be made requires first a little background. Christians have always referred to God as the Father. But viewing God as a father didn't start here. It goes back far into the ancient world. The reason is, according to the mystery religion, our planet was always viewed as our mother earth, our mother nature, and that's where all this mother earth and earth goddess comes from in the New Age movement. And since rain, the life-bringing fluid, or the semen, falling from heaven, impregnated and brought life to Mother Earth, it was therefore believed that our Father was in heaven. All this life-bringing intercourse between God the Father and Mother Earth would be after a proper marriage ceremony at a spring wedding. In the area today called Israel, anciently called, quote, the land of Canaan, unquote, the sexual fertility rites of spring were celebrated each year in what was called, quote, the marriage feast of Canaan, unquote. And so the New Testament story was, Mother Earth asked God's Son to draw water from the sea for the grapes to make fine wine for the wedding feast. And this marriage feast story is over 5,000 years old. 3,000 years before the New Testament story, and the mystery schools believe it is just one more case of pious plagiarism. Now it is at this point we need to go back to the ancient Egyptians to further understand this story. Though all of the essential pieces of the Christian story were long in existence before Egypt, the only thing different, folks, is the names were changed to protect the innocent, it was with the coming of the pharaohs that the story was finally codified and became religious dogma. Though the story varied in some details from place to place in Egypt, the essence was always the same. 
God's Son, spelled S-U-N, our risen Savior, was the light of the world who gave his life for us. Now remember, this is according to the belief of the mystery religion of Babylon. From the Egyptian records, we learn that the newborn son, Horus, was given the title the Logos, which means the Word. Egyptians further said the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and since we enjoy only one son in heaven, he was said to be the only begotten of the Father. The Word was lost, and that story is told in the Osirian cycle of Isis, Osiris, and the child Horus. And you will learn that the symbol of the word today is the obelisk, the monolith, the stone. It is also called the lost word of Freemasonry. And I will explain the meaning of all of those things later. Another interesting point not to be missed concerning Horus Later in Egyptian history, he was given a second name, Isos, or Isis, meaning holder of the light. Still later, in Roman Latin, I became interchangeable with J, so from Isis we get Jesus. All of this can be read by anyone in a public library, <coughs> if you so desire. In ancient Egypt, it was said that if you wanted to follow the life of God's Son and thereby live in the light of God's Word, our Logos, one would first have to leave his old ways of life to follow the Son face to the east. But before beginning this new life in the Word, one must die to the old way of life and be born again. George Bush, when asked at a press conference by a reporter if he was a Christian, Mr. Bush said this, quote, If you're asking if I have been born again, the answer is yes, unquote. Your first birth was out of the water your mother formed you in. Because her water broke and your new life began, Rebirth is symbolized by coming out of total immersion in water, or baptism, or being born again. These points here mentioned are just some of hundreds, if not thousands, of direct connections that can be made between the Judaic Christian Bible story and the far more ancient original story. The purpose for drawing your attention to this literary plagiarism according to the Mystery School, this is what they believe, is best stated by Alfred North Whitehead, who said, quote, no lie can live forever, unquote. They hate Christians, they hate Christianity. And the first object is to destroy the Christian church and Christians, to wipe them off the face of the earth. If you are a Christian, you are in the greatest danger that you can even imagine at this moment as the new world order takes shape around you. Egyptologist Gerald Massey said, quote, They must find it difficult, those who have taken authority as the truth, rather than truth as the authority, unquote. And now for a few thoughts on the Old Testament word of God according again to the mystery religion remember I am revealing the secrets of the mystery religion of Babylon during this broadcast at Malachi 4 2 the God of heaven is described as the son of righteousness with healing in his wings and it is spelled as you in the son with healing in his wings then in the New Testament, at Matthew 23, verse 37, and Luke 13, verse 34, we see God's Son wanting to gather all under, quote, his wings, unquote. This is most appropriate, for in Egypt the Son was always pictured with his wings. And you see a disc with wings. Now all these pitiful little twits running around calling themselves ufologists, and Zachariah Sitchin, who has perverted the interpretation of the ancient writings, 
claims that this means that the Egyptians, whenever they drew these or put these hieroglyphics on in their writings, were indicating that UFOs came from other planets, and nothing can be farther from the truth. But this is part of the mystery Babylon deception trying to convince the people of the earth that we are threatened by some other species from some other planet so that they can more quickly bring about their new world order, their one world totalitarian socialist government. Don't fall for it, folks. I have found that most of these people involved with the so-called UFO research who are trying to convince you of this are Freemasons, most of them 32nd degree of the Scottish Rite. And evidently they are attempting to do their best toward the furtherance of the great work in order to attain the 33rd degree, which can only be attained by meritorious work to bring about the completion of the great work, which is the destruction of the church, the state, and the enslavement of the mob, which is all of us. I hope you hear me out there. In the most ancient Egyptian understanding of things, mankind was called the sheep of God. And the great orb of day, God's son, was the overseer, or in the exact words from the ancient Egyptian manuscript, the good shepherd. And we are his flock. All ancient kings thought of their people as sheep to be pastured with themselves as the shepherd. Sheep are ideal followers, you see, for they do not think for themselves, but will blindly follow anyone without question, and that's why I call most people sheeple. It's truly admirable behavior for animals, but it is very, very unwise for humans. Sheep were born to be fleeced, and have the wool pulled over their eyes, and are eventually always led to the slaughter. Lastly, they end up as a tasty meal eaten by their masters, and their skin, or their hide, or their wool, is worn as an apron around a Freemason's waist. <laughs> How about that? Keep all of the foregoing in mind, folks. We read again from the Old Testament book of Psalms. At Psalms chapter 23, verse 4, we read that old, dog-eared, tired, exhausted, and equally misunderstood chestnut, according to the mystery schools, used by every man of the cloth to put the sheep to sleep. We quote it here. Quote, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me, unquote. Thy rod and thy staff? Here in the book of Psalms, the Old Testament God is pictured with his rod and staff. The rod here mentioned is the king's rod of discipline, and the staff is the shepherd's staff or crook. Now, for the correct understanding of this old verse, any good library book on the Egyptian religion will tell you that the ancient pharaohs were said to be ruling for God's son, spelled S-U-N, on earth. He was called king of the kingdom and the great shepherd of his sheep. In the hands of the pharaoh god, whose arms formed the sign of the cross on his chest, were placed the royal symbols of heavenly power, the rod which was a flail, and the staff. The rod was used to beat those who were disobedient, and the staff with the crook was used to herd the sheep. Incidentally, Jesus is pictured not only with his shepherd's staff, but at Revelations 12, verse 5, and Revelation 19, verse 15, is also said to rule with a rod of iron. And I have pictures here of all of this. You can't see it, but you can go to the library and find this stuff. Our research has been thorough. And we have managed to place members of Kaji within the Masonic Lodges, and we have verified everything that we are telling you here now. We have infiltrated the Lodge. 
In Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 2 through 6, in Isaiah chapter 64, verse 8, we see the God of the Old Testament portrayed in a different way. Here, he is said to be the great potter who fashions man on a potter's wheel. Almighty God, the great potter. In Jeremiah chapter 18, let me read to you what it says. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise, and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make it. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter? Saith the Lord, Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand, O house of Israel. In Isaiah chapter 64, But now, O Lord, thou art our father, we are the clay, and thou our potter, and we are all the work of thy hand. The potter story was Egyptian. A thousand years before it was written by the writers of the Bible. And I have a picture here taken from Egyptian hieroglyphics, and you can find this in a book called The African Belief in God. It shows the hieroglyphics taken right off of the Egyptian temples, and it shows the god. Nimu fashioning the body of one of the Ptolemies on his potter's wheel. And here's another picture, the god Nimu fashioning a man upon a potter's table, and behind him stands Thoth, marking his span of life on a staff. In Egypt, God's risen son was Horus. At twelve noon he became the Most High. In this exalted position, he became the mediator between God and man. His name was Amun-Ra. Ra equals ray of the sun. His shepherds on earth were called priests of Amun. They would direct their prayers to the invisible God, the Father, through his mediator. Amun-Ra and God's son was the great Amun with his rays. In the New Testament, he, the Son, is still called at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, and Revelations chapter 1, verse 7, and Revelations chapter 3, verse 14, the Amen. At the end of prayers in the temples of Egypt, they would say, Amen. How does that grab you? Now look at the word Israel. I S Isis R A Ra L God. It is the androgynous God, and it's been in front of your eyes all the time. All the time, folks. Anyone who goes to any library and does the research that we have done can reveal that the religion of Mystery Babylon is exactly as I have stated it last Friday night and during this broadcast and will continue to state it because there is a lot more, folks. We have, in fact, not even yet begun. For this is the only ancient portion, the beginning of the ancient worship of Baal, or Baal as some pronounce it, Ba was the sun. El means God. And that was the beginning of the end of our civilization as we know it if we do not wake up now. I firmly believe, and I live my life according to this, that I owe my first allegiance to my God and Jesus Christ. 
My second allegiance I owe to the Constitution of the United States of America and my third allegiance to my family. And the reason my allegiance is that in that order is because God endowed man with unalienable rights. The Constitution protects those rights and the family is thus able to survive and be protected and thrive. And the family is the basic unit of civilization. Period. And I further believe that any man or woman without principles that they are ready and willing to die for at any given moment that they are called upon to do it are already dead and are of no use are consequence to anyone, not even themselves. Understand what I just said. I have to take a short break, folks. Don't go away. I'll be right back after this short pause. Isis was the patroness of the magical arts among the Egyptians. The use to which magic should be put is revealed in the Osirian cycle where Isis applies the most potent of her charms and invocations to accomplish the resurrection of Osiris. In other words, the redemption of the human soul. That the gods of Egypt were elements of a profound magical system and possessed a significance far different from that advanced by modern Egyptologists is certain. The various deities of the Nile Valley were elements of an elaborate magical metaphysical system, a kind of ceremonial Kabbalah. This cannot be denied. But even when impressed with the reality of this fact, the modern Egyptologist still balks. Supposing, he asked, that the Egyptians did possess an elaborate metaphysical doctrine. Of what value is its rediscovery in an age when the natural has been demonstrated to be mediocre and the supernatural non-existent? Even if these extinct persons whose mummies clutter up our museums were the custodians of some mysterious lore, we have simply outgrown it. Let the dead past bury its dead, they say. We prefer to live in an era of enlightenment, an enlightenment which you would blight by asking us to espouse the superstitions of our remote ancestors. These so-called superstitions, however, it is interesting to note, die hard. In fact, they do not die at all, but insinuate themselves as a discordant note in our matter-of-fact existences. McCall's magazine published some time ago an article by Edgar Wallace entitled The Curse of Amun-Ra, dealing with the phenomena attendant upon the opening of the tomb of the Pharaoh Tutankhamun. After vividly describing the curse of Amun-Ra, the author sums up the effect of this curse upon those who came in contact with the tomb or its contents. His statements are in substance as follows. At the time the tomb was opened, the party present at the excavations included the Earl of Carnarvon, Howard Carter and his secretary, Dick Bethel, M. Benedite, the French archaeologist, and M. Pasanova. Of these, only one, Howard Carter, remains alive. Now that was at the time of the article. Colonel Aubrey Herbert, Carnarvon's half-brother, and Evelyn White, who also entered the tomb, were both dead within a year, one by suicide. Sir Archibald Douglas Reed, the radiologist who took an x-ray of the mummy, was also dead within 12 months. And Professor Lafleur of McGill University, the first American scientist to examine the death chamber, did not leave Luxor alive. Wolf Joel visited the tomb and was dead within a year. Jay Gould was taken ill within the tomb and died. Attendants whose duty it was to look after the exhibit from the tomb in the Cairo Museum also sickened and died. Seven French authors and journalists visited the tomb and six were dead within two years. When they unveiled Tutankhamun, they found a mark upon his face, and by a strange coincidence, the mark left upon the face of Lord Carnarvon, which presumably caused his death, was in exactly the same spot and of similar appearance. Nor does this list include the numerous native workmen who perished from the curse. Only recently 
another name was added to the long list associated with the tragedy. Arthur Weigall, after a long and mysterious illness, similar to that defined in the curse, is the most recent victim. The eminent authority on antiquities, Dr. Martis said, quote, The Egyptians, for 7,000 years, possessed the secret of surrounding their mummies with some dynamic force of which we have only the faintest idea, unquote. Over the entrance to the tomb of Tutankhamun was a magical tablet inscribed with strange hieroglyphics. Dr. Martis named this tablet the Stella of Malediction, for it pronounced a fearful curse upon any sacrilegious person who might violate the sanctuary of the deified head, and it was called the Stell. The words upon the Stella were as follows. O ye beings from above, O ye beings from below, phantoms riding the breaths of men, ye of the crossroads and of the great highways, wanderers beneath the shade of night, and ye from the abysses of the west on the fringes of the twilight, dwellers in the caverns of obscurity, who rouse terrors and shuddering, and ye walkers by night, whom I will not name, friends of the moon, and ye intangible inhabitants of the world of night, O people, O denizens of the tombs, all of you approach and be my witnesses and my respondents. Let the hand raised against my form be withered. Let them be destroyed who attack my name, my foundation, my effigies, the images like unto me. Unquote. Can modern Egyptologists and scientists in all branches and departments view lightly the culture of the Egyptians if their researches into the forces of nature gave them such strange power and enabled them to master natural laws of which modern learning has no knowledge or conception? Did you know that Lars Hansen was reared in the Stell group? Did you know that a very famous talk show host who covers for the Masons all the time was a member? Also was heavily involved with the Communist Party? Did you know these things? Do you ever bother to check you who listen to these people and believe them blindly? You, the sheeple of the world? Circumstances so extraordinary as the curse of King Tutankhamun simply overtax the theory of mere coincidence, folks. Nor is this an isolated case, as those will remember who read the accounts of the Cleopatra mummy curse many years ago. It will also be noted that in this age of moral certitudes, the story of the Tutankhamun curse had no sooner been broadcast than several of our large museums were deluged by gifts of Egyptian antiquities from private individuals who no longer desired to own them. And these persons, most of them well-educated, as modern education goes, were not superstitious. They were just careful. The following article appeared in an English newspaper in 1923. Quote, the death of Lord Carnarvon has been followed by a panic among collectors of Egyptian antiquities. All over the country, people are sending their treasures to the British Museum, anxious to get rid of them because of the superstition that Lord Carnarvon was killed by the Ka, or double of the soul of Tutankhamun. These fears are, it is hardly necessary to state, absolutely groundless." Unquote. It's also hardly necessary, folks, to add that the journalist fails to give his authority for the last sentence. The newspaper article continues, quote, An avalanche of parcels containing mummies, shriveled hands and feet, porcelain and wooden statuettes, and other relics from the ancient tombs descended this week on the British Museum. Fear inspires these gifts, brought by every post, the belief that a dead king's curse is potent for evil after thousands of years won thousands of adherents on the day when Lord Carnarvon became ill. Few of the parcels received at the museum bear the sender's name. The owners, in their eagerness to wash their hands of the accursed things, have tried to keep their identity secret. The British Museum is a godsend to the superstitious. It offers a means of shifting the liability to expert shoulders. The museum authorities are used to such liabilities, having harbored the coffin lid of the powerful priestess of Amun-Ra for years. 
but they are not at all grateful for the present flood of gifts. The museum weathered a similar storm some years ago, when the story of the curse of the priestess of Amun-Ra became public. Sufficient scare gifts were received to fill a large showcase. A long chain of fatalities has been attributed to the curse of the priestess. Men who have made fun of the superstitious have died within the year. Another story is that a photographer took pictures of the priestess and placed the plates in his safe. When he went to look at them some weeks later, the glass had become a thin brown powder." Unquote. Now let us consider the rational explanation, so-called adduced by science in disposing of the superstition of the king's curse. Dr. Frederick H. Cowles, FRGS, famous British scientist, declared in an interview years ago that Lord Carnarvon and a number of workmen engaged in excavation met their deaths as the result of a poisonous and almost invisible dust placed there purposely by the wily priests to bring destruction upon the violators of the dead. Quote, this poisonous dust, unquote, says Dr. Coles, quote, analysis of which has baffled scientists was scattered about the tomb. Lord Carnarvon was not the only one to note its fatal property, as a number of workmen engaged in the excavation were likewise stricken. Most of these died a lingering death, but others, greatly impaired in health, have recovered." Unquote. There is nothing in the learned doctor's explanation, however, to account for the fact that Howard Carter did not chance to breathe any of the noxious vapors, although he was more steadily engaged in the work of excavation than even Lord Carnarvon. It's also questioned how much science actually knows about this mysterious dust which defies analysis, for if it cannot be analyzed, how can it be either identified with certainty or even proved poisonous? The term poisonous dust is evidently the charitable term that covers a multitude of scientific shortcomings. Several years later, there was another revelation that they were stricken with some virus that inhabits ancient tombs. And who knows what the real story is? Though sorcery has been accorded no official recognition by modern science, there is nevertheless a certain quasi-official acceptance of the reality of occult phenomena throughout the civilized world. In a newspaper interview, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle illustrates the widespread recognition of the idea that the Egyptians knew how to surround their dead with mysterious guardian agencies which throughout the centuries visited their vengeance upon grave robbers, scientific or otherwise. In discussing with the correspondent of the Daily Express the death of a certain Mr. Fletcher, who had felt the wrath of Egypt's dead, Conan Doyle declared that the tragedy was caused by Egyptian elementals guarding a female mummy because another student of Egyptology, a Mr. Robinson, had begun an, investi an investigation of the stories of the mummy's malevolence. Quote, I warned Mr. Robinson, he says, against concerning himself with the mummy at the British Museum. He persisted and his death followed, unquote. You may wonder where all this is going. But it becomes clear when you understand that the Egyptians inherited the religion of Babylon. So are we to presume that this single phase of ceremonial magic constituted the entire repertoire of the Egyptian thaumaturgists? You see, if they could manifest such surprising power, is it not probable that they possessed a knowledge of other natural hidden forces forces as yet unknown to the modern public world, which is possibly of inestimable value, which may still be contained within what is called the secrets of the ages, which is guarded by the modern mystery school, which is still the ancient mystery school brought forward through the ages. We are assured in the authorized version, and note I say authorized version, of Holy Writ that the magicians of Egypt changed their staves or rods into serpents 
in the presence of Pharaoh. The modern scientist does not live who can duplicate that phenomena, yet if he happens to be a good Christian, he is in somewhat of a dilemma. We can pass over all the desperate efforts to disprove the magical powers of the Egyptians as arising not from a mature knowledge, but from a desperate prejudice. You see, magic is too ancient and too universal to be explained away by mirrors, wires, and hinges. In Egypt, we are dealing unquestionably with true manifestations of occult power. The learned author of Art Magic presents what may be accepted as a reasonable, accurate estimation of the priest magicians of the old Egyptian mysteries. Quote, they were highly educated scientific men. They understood the nature of the lodestone, the virtues of mineral and animal magnetism, which together with the force of psychological impression constituted a large portion of their theurgic practices. They perfectly understood the art of reading the innermost secrets of the soul of impressing the susceptible imagination by enchantment and fascination, of sending their own spirits forth from the body, which many modern metaphysical teachers claim that they can do, as clairvoyance under the action of powerful will. In fact, they were masters of the art now known as mesmerism, clairvoyance, electrobiology, etc., they also realized the virtues of magnets, gums, herbs, drugs, and fumigations and employed music to admirable effect and no one since has been able to perfect or even come close to their art of embalming the dead. The highly gifted Egyptologist Lenormand acknowledges Egyptian magic as an essential part of their religious philosophy. James Bonwick FRGS thus summarizes the powers possessed by Egyptian adepts. Quote, Egyptian mystics could levitate, walk the air, handle fire, live underwater, sustain great pressure, harmlessly suffer mutilation, read the past, foretell the future, make themselves invisible, and cure disease. Unquote. Now, I have no idea whether to believe that or not, but that is what this expert says. Now if you doubt the power of magic wielded by the priests of Mystery Babylon, listen to this. For we can compare James Bonwick's account with some other news from Tibet, another land long famous for magic. Dr. Alexander Cannon, a distinguished scientist, a doctor of medicine, a celebrated psychiatrist, a master of arts, and a fellow of the Royal Geographic Society, brought back a strange record from the land of the Lamas. He claimed he saw a tree withered by a pointed finger, a dead man raised to life, the Grand Lama surrounded by a blue aura three inches thick, and a human being lifted into the air by pure mental effort. The London County Council called upon Dr. Cannon to resign his post as the head of a noted institution for his remarks, but later, strangely enough, after further inquiry, withdrew the demand. It would seem, folks, that the age of miracles, or at least magic, is not dead. You know, Plato, and I wrote this in my book, was an initiate of Mystery Babylon and was actually initiated in the Great Pyramid in Egypt where he lay in the sarcophagus for three days and three nights. He entered as a mortal man and, according to his writings, emerged as a god, given or imparted knowledge which he was to guard and keep. Remember, they called themselves the guardians of the secrets of the ages. From the writings of Proclus and Iamblichus, we can gain a considerable insight into the principles of Egyptian magic. To the old philosophers, even Pythagoras and Plato, magic was no mystery. 
According to Proclus, the initiated priests so fully understood the mutual sympathy between the visible and invisible worlds that they were able to change the course of action and focus divine virtues upon inferior natures. And according to Plato, the highest form of magic consisted in the divine worship of the gods, plural, and according to Iamblichus, the priests, through sacerdotal theurgy, were able to ascend from a material state of unconsciousness to a realization of the universal essence, thus coming to an understanding of universal purpose by which the performance of high feats of magic became possible. Thousands of years later, Aleister Crowley claimed the same thing. Now this is significant. It's proper at this point to establish a clear line of demarcation between magic and sorcery. You see, the term magic was not associated with occult jugglery by the Egyptians, but arose from a profound understanding of natural law. Magic, said General Albert Pike, and you will be hearing an awful lot of General Albert Pike during this series of shows. Magic, says General Albert Pike, is the exact and absolute science of nature and its laws. Unquote. From the knowledge of this absolute science arises occult science. Occult merely means hidden, folks. From experience in occult science, in turn, arises the theurgic art. For as surely as man has adapted his physical universe to his purposes, so surely the adept of the mystery school adapts the metaphysical universe to his purposes. To acknowledge that the Egyptians possessed the power of adapting mystical forces to physical ends is to bestow upon them proficiency in the most perfect and difficult of the arts, according to the mystery religion of Babylon. Yet to deny this ability on the part of the Egyptian priests is to deny the evident, and we must resign ourselves to the undeniable fact that they possessed a form of learning which has not been conferred upon this present race, at least publicly. Men like Aleister Crowley have proven that it has been passed down through the ages and is kept and practiced secretly by those who call themselves the guardians of the secrets of the ages. Now folks, we are in desperate need of money to help pay for airtime. If you like this show, if you want it to stay on the air, then please reach down in your pockets, contribute the most that you can possibly afford. Make your checks out to WWCR, not to me. This is going straight to the radio station to pay for airtime. Not one single penny of it goes in my pocket, or anybody else's for that matter. goes to the radio station. Make them out to WWCR. If you would like a list of tapes or available materials or would like an information packet or learn how to join CAGI, the Citizens Agency for Joint Intelligence, then send your checks, your donations made out to WWCR and your request for information to P.O. Box 889, Camp Verde, Arizona, 86322. That's P.O. Box 889, Camp Verde, Arizona, 86322. Or you can just call Stan and ask him to send you a packet of information. He'll also tell you the price of tapes, whether you're a CAGI member or not. The price is different depending upon that. Call Stan at 602-567-6109. That's 602-567-6109. If you write in, please address the envelope to Stan, S-T-A-N. Good night, folks, and God bless you. And remember, this is what can happen if you just wake up.